Hello students, this is a brief introduction to St. Thomas Aquinas OP, OP being Order of Preachers. So first let's uh, get some basic uh, biographical information. St. Thomas Aquinas was born in 1225, as near as we can figure historically, and died in about 1274. Interestingly, these uh, birth, and especially his death date, parallel that of St. Bonaventure, who's kind of the Franciscan equivalent, but not quite as good, of St. Thomas Aquinas. And then Thomas was canonized less than 50 years after his death, which is, I mean, in medieval times, it's kind of quick. Um, canonized in 1323 by Pope John the 22nd. Now, it's also good to have a little family background on St. Thomas Aquinas. And the first thing to know about the Aquino family is that they were immensely well-connected. Uh, very noble. They were uh, Thomas himself was related to two Holy Roman Emperors, Henry the Sixth and Fe Frederick the Second, and also he was related to the kings of Castile and Aragon, which are in present-day Spain, and the King of France. So this is someone with uh, very, very close ties to nobility. Um, so that that shapes you. And uh, secondly, the Aquino family was very wealthy. How wealthy? Well, the kind of wealthy that has its own castle. These are the ruins of the, their castle at Roca Seca, where St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, I believe, was born. Okay, so the, the family itself was, um, they, were, they were in like the top 1% of the 1%. They, were, they did very well. And I've also note that Thomas's brother, most uh, a lot of his brothers spent time as soldiers, and um, for, for part of the time, the... Uh, the uh, the Pope was fighting against the Holy Roman Empire. Now at this time, the the Pope actually was also a temporal monarch. He had territory. So you have the Papal States here. If you look at this map, so it's a territory controlled controlled by by the Holy See. And at times, the Pope, uh, the Papal States were actually at war with the Holy Roman Empire. And for a time, Thomas's brothers fought on the side of the Holy Roman Empire, and then they switched and fought for the Papal States, and one of them died. That's going to be important later on. Now, when we look at uh, St. Thomas's uh, uh, life, in terms of his education and his religious life, he started out at the Abbey of Monte Cassino. Uh, this is a extremely old monastery in Italy, um, and that's going to we're going to come back to that later. But he was educated at Monte Cassino, and then the abbot of Monte Cassino told Thomas's father, look, you can't, you can't let someone with Thomas's gifts die in obscurity. So they had him sent to the University of Naples in 1236. Now remember, most uh, universities at this point aren't even 100 years old. Uh, so e even some of the oldest, like at Paris and Bologna, I believe were less than 100 years old, old at this time. So he sent to the university this new center of learning, and then a couple years later, he's received into the Dominicans. He receives the Dominican uh, habit in about 1242. And that was the sign that you had entered uh, the Dominican order at the time. That was kind of the definitive, definitive sign. A couple years later, he began studies with uh, St. Albert the Great uh, in, uh, I think it was, I can't remember, Bologna or Paris. And then he began teaching at the University of Paris in 1251. And that's the beginning of his public teaching career. Now, a couple of interesting stories about Thomas to help you get a better idea of the man and uh, something that might be worth uh, noting down. So, I mentioned before the, uh, uh, the Abbey of Monte Cassino. So, huge, huge monastery, the oldest, basically the oldest and richest monastery in Europe. And this thing had been around at this point for almost 800 years. And during that time, you know, people would donate land to the monastery and ask the monks to pray for them after they died. And the way monasteries work is that the monks individually don't have a lot of power. The, there's one guy who has a lot of power and who controls the money, and that's the abbot. Okay, so Thomas studies at the Abbey of Monte Cassino. They see how brilliant he is. Thomas's brother, as I mentioned, was fighting for the Papal States and died in the Pope's service. And so the Pope, in order to cement ties with the Aquino family and to reward them for uh, their sacrifice that they had made in fighting on, on his behalf, offers to make St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas the abbot of Monte Cassino. Now, this is the 13th century equivalent of winning the lottery. And not like the little scratch-off ticket lottery, like the Powerball lottery. And so Mrs. Aquino is there thinking, cha-ching, cha-ching. And Thomas says, uh... 
no, I'm joining the Dominicans, which at this point in time is a ragtag group that is, you know, not even 30 years old. Who knows how long they're going to exist? And he said, no, 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 I'm joining these guys. Well, his mother pitches a fit and sends her other sons to kidnap Thomas Aquinas and lock him in the family castle at Roca Seca. And this is a reconstructed tower uh, that's been uh, reconstructed because that was the tower that Thomas was allegedly kidnapped and, and imprisoned in for two years. Now, he made good use of that time. He spent a lot of time memorizing scripture and became very, very familiar with the Bible. Uh, but his family was still smarting over the fact that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't control Monte Cassino. Eventually, Mama relents, and she, she decides, oh, I'm not going to be able to break Thomas, so might as well let him go do his thing. And so he does. He joins the uh, Dominican order and becomes hugely influential. Just to give you a, just a small, just a very small taste of what he did. He's, he's considered one of the top three theologians of all time that the church has ever produced. The only other contender for that spot, really, for number one, is St. Augustine. So at least he's in at least the top two. Uh, many popes and saints will refer to his writings, and they use those as kind of the touchstone. He also redefined the Dominican order. After Dominic founds it as an order that, that is to be devoted to study and to preaching, that stays the same. But Dominic wasn't big on this whole philosophy thing. But Thomas comes in, and Thomas is incorporating Plato and especially Aristotle into his writing and showing how that can benefit uh, the church and, and, and theology. And so he helps to refocus the order more on philosophy uh, and also to the natural sciences, and that all gets incorporated in, in addition to the study of sacred scripture. And finally, you really see Thomas's influence when the Council of Trent happens about 300 years after he dies. And there, there are lots of questions about the sacraments, about scripture, about revelation, about faith. All these issues come up. And what do they go back to time and time again? Thomas Aquinas. And they, uh, in very large part on all these controversial questions, they take the position that Thomas had, had passed on. So a tremendously influential uh, theologian and also a man of great integrity. Ooh, I forgot one story. So uh, when, uh, when Mama Aquino locks little Tommy in, uh, in the tower at Roca Seca, <laughs> hoping it changes his mind. One of the things she does is she hires a hooker and throws her in the room with Thomas, hoping that she'll work her magic and he'll see the light. Well, that doesn't quite work. Uh, Thomas ends up grabbing a hot poker out of the fire and chasing this poor woman out of the room screaming. And after that happens, I mean, because Thomas is like not letting go of his, uh, his chastity and his virginity. This is a gift that he intends to, to guard jealously. After he chases her out of the room, he, he told a friend at the very end of his life that after that happened, two angels visited him and they put around him a cord, uh, this, this cincture of, of purity. And basically, uh, from that point on, Thomas never had another sexual temptation in his life. So interesting little... A uh, little story there on uh, Thomas and his virtue and his family drama. So, you know, families can be interesting. All right, so that's an introduction to Thomas Aquinas.